crowd doesn't tell me how many, but this I know. Granted the tinderbox atmosphere of Passover, granted the volatile character of Pilate, granted the fact that these people are coming up to get a violent revolutionary out and Pilate might decide to grab them all. Hey, good, here's some more supporters, grab them. I would say that crowd in front of Pilate, you want a number? Nine. You know, somewhere between six and a dozen. Anything more than that is looking to get themselves killed. And they better come with a lot of bowing and scraping and yes sirring and no sirring and please sirring and keep your arms out where we can see your hands. Nothing under your cloak. So the, cry, the story as you have it in Mark is not about Jesus going up to get himself killed. It is about Jesus going up to do something very, very dangerous. A double nonviolent demonstration against religious collaboration with imperial power. And, as we know, it gets him killed. Now, let me focus for a second on another word. Holding on to that is the story. The word sacrifice. Because whenever you're reading the New Testament, you're going to find sacrifice all over the place. And most people, when they see sacrifice, put in substitutionary sacrifice. And what I'm going to say is that that is totally invalid. Sacrifice is not necessarily substitutionary. Let me take a fast detour for a moment. Because you have to understand what blood sacrifice is about. It's not something we do, so you have to understand what it's about. Basically this. You probably have never heard from a pulpit before an anthropology of blood sacrifice. Human beings, forget God and the gods for a second, human beings have two ways of keeping good relations or restoring good relations if they've had a row with one another. One is the gift. The other is the meal. If I want to maintain relations with you or restore them if there's a problem, I could give you a gift or I could invite you to a meal. That's basic anthropology. It's as simple as this. It's not rocket science. Two weeks before Christmas, you get a gift from somebody you had no intention of even sending a card to. What is the first thing you're going to do? Probably. Hustle out and get a gift, send it back, and maybe predate it if you can. <laughs> the gift. So therefore, when people think, how do we maintain good relations with God or the gods? How do we do this? Well, we will give them a gift, however that is done, and of course they want something back. They don't want God or the gods to say, thank you very much, that was lovely. It's a sort of noblesse oblige. If we give God something, of course we're going to get something back. But what I want to insist is that substitution has nothing whatsoever to do with it. If you're having a sacrificial meal, it means that you take your animal, your sheep, for example, at Passover, you give it to God. That's what putting the blood on the altar is about. You give it to God, and God gives it back to you so that you may have a meal with your God. It's called a sacrifice, which in Latin is sacrum facere, to make sacred. You have taken ordinary food, which would be ordinary if you and I were just having a meal. You've given it to God to make it sacred, so when it comes back with you, you, as it were, eat sacred food with your God. And that's what it's about. It has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with sacrifice in the sense of substitution. Nobody is thinking. We really are evil people. We should be killed, but let's take it out on the goat. <laughs> They're not thinking that. Even on the Day of Atonement, sins are put on the goat, and the goat is driven out, out of the habited land into the desert. Nobody would think in the ancient world, this is going to be a great sacrifice, so let's, let's really make the animals suffer. It, it's obscene even to say it, and I hope you winced internally. Nobody thought of that. What they're thinking of is in the ordinary model, if we are going to have a feast with our God, that it's modeled on the feast with one another, and there will be blood. Of course, there'll be an animal killed to eat. Suff keep, keep apart. Sacrifice, substitution, suffering. Keep them separate. Never mix them up. Nobody in the ancient world would do it. Last year when we were in Ireland, in the National Museum, they had some 
bog bodies, bodies that have been found in the bog and they've been found all over Celtic, pre-Christian Celtic Europe. And the theory behind them is that we have some terrible disaster, let's say drought, maybe three years with a bad harvest. We want to give a gift to the gods to get something back. They're not thinking we should be killed, but let's kill somebody else instead. A human being, and sometimes a very high prince, maybe even a druid prince in one case, is actually put to death. I would even say willingly. I would even say willingly. And the body then is put into the bog. The reason it's put into the bog is that the gods are down there in the water, and the bog is the place where the, where the earth and the water kind of mix, and you can't tell which is which. So if you want to give it to the gods, a bog is one of the favorite places in the Celtic world. And of course, if it gets into a bog, it is preserved almost perfectly. You can even see the stubble on some of the male bodies. But it's a gift. It's a gift to the gods. Nobody is thinking, this is substitution. We should really be killed and punished, but let's take it out on this person. Now, always, of course, you expect something back. The gift is never simply, here's a nice gift, God, have a nice day. No, we expect something major back. All right. The sacrifice. Jesus' death is a sacrifice, meaning that Jesus has taken his life and knowingly that it is possible, and you have to presume that Jesus knew what he was doing was dangerous. He knew what had happened to John the Baptist. It's one thing to say he's looking to get himself killed. It's very different to say he knows this is dangerous and could get him killed, and Jesus did. So for the integrity of his life, he makes his death sacred, sacrum facere. You could say any death is sacred. All human death, like all human life, is sacred. But to die as a martyr makes your death peculiarly, especially, emphatically, particularly sacred. Let me give you an everyday example. Because we need to keep that word sacrifice. Imagine a house on fire. A baby, a child is up on the second floor. The firefighter rushes in goes upstairs to save the baby, manages to catch the baby and drop it down to some firefighters waiting below. Then the entire roof crashes in and she's killed instantly. Next day's headline says, firefighter sacrifices her life. Now I think that is exactly right. Firefighter dies during fire, not really. Sacrum fatuary, to make sacred, any death, like any life of a human being, is sacred. But she has made her life and her death peculiarly, especially, emphatically sacred because she's given it up to save somebody else and a stranger and a child. We need a word for that. So when you read in the New Testament the sacrifice of Christ, do not lose sacrifice. Lose the substitution. And lose the emphasis on suffering. That's not the point. The suffering of a martyr is not the point. It is that you are willing to give up your life for the integrity of your vision. Final point. In Christian theology, we say, and it's quite often in the New Testament, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. The resurrection is about Jesus seated at the right hand of God. And most of us, most of us, recognize that as metaphorical. The one who is seated to the right hand of the king is the heir. The left hand would be the queen. The right hand would be the heir apparent. So to say that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God means that all that God is comes, speaking now within Christianity, to, to us through Jesus. Jesus is the heir. So it's a metaphor, but it's a profound metaphor with a profound meaning. And I want to take two points from it. First one is this. If Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, this is especially true for people who take everything literally, then God is to the left of Jesus. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. It's in the scriptures. <laughs> so 
if you want to find God, you first find Jesus and then you keep going left. <laughs> Second point is this. In Christian art, in Christian gospels first, Luke, John, in Christian art and in Christian mysticism, those who see the risen Christ always see the wounds. The wounds don't heal, which means that seated next to God in this vision is a body, as it were, which bears on it eternally the wounds of imperial injustice. What is seated next to God is not just Jesus, as it were, but the wounded one. And it is the wounded one who's been raised up to God. If seated next to God in our Christian tradition is somebody who's been executed by empire, what do you think God thinks about empire? What do you think God thinks about either the Roman Empire or the British Empire or the American Empire? 